Hi, it's Tom Adams, and I'm really happy you're here today. On each and every episode of the Advisory Board Insider Podcast, my goal is to have you meet and really get to know world-class experts, members, chairs, and even sponsors of advisory boards and in the advisory board space. Typically, my guests tend to fit one of those roles, tend to fit one of those slots, but my guest today actually continues to serve in multiple of those roles. I am thrilled and delighted today to welcome a business and philanthropic rock star to the podcast. From an entrepreneurial startup, he actually scaled that business, then went public, and then merged with another to actually end up being and leading a $2 billion, yeah, that's B, $2 billion uh, publicly traded company. And then, you know, along the way, and just as part of this journey, why he sat on the advisory boards of uh, back when they started uh, of companies like Research in Motion. You know, that BlackBerry company actually sat on that board, uh, on the founding board of that, um, as well as many others. And then, you know, not too long ago, as you'll learn today, he purchased a a full scale <laughs> manufacturing business that builds appliances. Well, my gosh. And if that weren't enough, this guy's got like success pedigree all over him as it relates to business. But you know, there's more. Back in 2019 or 2018, I can't remember which it was, but he's actually, he was awarded the coveted Order of Canada. Um, that's the country's highest award for civilians for those people who have made extraordinary and sustained contributions to the country. Uh, he's also received the Order of Ontario, which is uh, the province within Canada, uh, for the same kind of award. And he's been awarded an Everyday Heroes Award from the Global Hope Coalition. I am beyond honored and thrilled to share this conversation with the incredible Jim Estel, the CEO and owner of Danby Appliances, so you can learn about him, his life, and the insights he will share. Let's do this. Jim Estill, welcome to the Advisory Board Insider Podcast. I am glad you're here. Well, thanks for having me, Tom. It's been too many yeah. years. It has been many years. So I think one of the cool things uh, that we're doing today is uh, actually rekindling a conversation we started actually 24 years ago. I looked in my, uh, I looked in my uh, archives and, uh, and you and I did a TV broadcast interview back in 1999, uh, back in the day. And there's a whole lot has happened since then. But today I really want to talk about a, a lot of stuff that's happened in your world and then how it informs our conversation in terms of the subject of our conversation advisory board. But but let's start just for people who may not have a clue who you are, and uh, let's just start with what are your geographic coordinates? Where are you in the world? So I'm in Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Okay, so Guelph, Ontario, Canada, that's uh, that's west of Toronto uh, for Toronto. our international users um, and listeners. Um, so... Uh, west of Toronto in Guelph, um, let's be. Let's also then start with your morning drink of choice, because I'm always interested in the morning what you're drinking. Are are you? Uh, what what's your standard drink of choice every morning? Well, I was raised that you shouldn't drink before five o'clock. Oh, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> hey, hey. I I drink tea when I'm at home. Occasionally, when I'm out, I drink coffee. But uh, I'm more of a tea drinker than a coffee drinker. Now, are you a unique tea drinker? Do you have sort of predis? But is it does it have to be a Earl Grey or does it have to be a certain style? I really like English breakfast, old orange pico tea. Just regular tea is the is the choice, and nothing in it. Just just no, plain, just clear. Not nothing in it. Absolutely got it. All right. Um. So take me back to how you start your day. Like, how did you start your day today? And how do you start most days? So you've got your tea in hand now, but. You know, how early do you typically wake up? What's your very early morning routine? So I usually get up between 5.30 and 6.30. Um, and uh, if I'm good, I get on the elliptical, which I did today, and uh, lift some weights. But I'm not good most days or um, half the time. 
in which case I usually start doing my email. Um, okay. And I, I have studied time management enough to know you should be spending your higher energy time doing more creative things than doing your email. But for some reason, it just calls and says, you know, what fires were there overnight and what do I need to, and what do I need to know? And included in my email, I get emailed some news. So I do look at what happened in the world. But again, I recognize if I'm busy, I actually don't do that. And ironically, I never miss anything. If something really happened, then sure. I'm going to hear about it. Right. Right. And yet it's so weird how somehow, even if we know what to do, sometimes we don't do it. That, that, that's, that is correct. That's correct. Yeah. And a lot of that centers around the health issues, particularly because I know I should work out. I know I should, um, you know, exercise more. I know I should eat perfectly, but at the end of the day, you know, you put cookies in front of me, I eat them. Right. <laughs> right. So you have to keep cookies out of the house. So that's it. So you're in your email, you're, you're drinking your tea and that generally forms your day if you, if you've done exercise or not, but, but that's generally the pattern. So that's great. Uh, it just gives me a sense of, you know, how you, how you, uh, frame your day a lot of times. Um, so let's go back into your history and I, I, if you're open to it, let's go back to Woodstock, Ontario in the sort of 1974, 75 range. Uh, Woodstock is west of Guelph towards London, Ontario, which is kind of halfway between Toronto and Windsor, Detroit, that that whole stretch. Um, a relatively small town, but it's your high school, roughly your high school graduation year. What's happening in your world? What are you thinking about? What's dream? What are you dreaming about in your world right now? Well, when I was in high school, I started a painting business, painting houses. This was before the days of college pro painters and stuff like that. And I had, you know, more than a dozen employees and trucks and scaffolding and ladders. And so I was just painting, uh, um, had very high work ethic. I painted hundreds of houses in Woodstock. I was probably thinking about that. At the same time, I was preparing to go to university. Um, and uh, so I went, you know, I was preparing to university. I suppose uh, I was thinking about girls. I mean, when you're that age, you got to. So you've got this painting company and like, I, I think back and I went to, uh, I went to high school in Forest, Ontario. And in, in my graduating year, I was not doing a job. I was just kind of like that, that, that's an interesting perspective. You, you didn't just do a, like a little thing on the side where it was part-time you had trucks and people like that, that. Like, what were you thinking? Like, that's why I'm kind of intrigued by that, because that seems like a massive amount of stuff to be doing. Well, it, it was my first sizable business. It wasn't sizable, but it was uh, sizable when you're a kid or yeah. you know, high school. Um, and I, I really, my, at one point, my dad asked me to help him paint the house and he showed me how to paint. And then one of the neighbors asked if they could pay, you know, if, if they would pay me to paint the fence. So I said, sure, pay me paint the fence. I, every kid wants money. And then, uh, someone else said they wanted it. And, uh, um, next thing, you know, I, I'd, I'd walk around and see people's, you know, soffit and eaves and windows that need a painting. And I hand wrote a piece of paper and put it in the door, uh, Bernstein painting called Jim or, you know, Jim's painting and gave my home phone number, right. um, <laughs> that my mom would answer. And, right. uh, uh, then as I got more sophisticated over time, I ended up with a form that I would fill in. So I would fill in to say, you know, windows, soffits, um, eaves, blah, blah, blah. Um, and time on site, all this kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and I learned to follow up. So I would basically go knock on the door. And by the time I was at the end of the business, I wasn't painting much. I was, it's the same as, uh, you know, I'm Danby appliance. I don't make any, uh, freezers or right. wine coolers. I kind of talked to you and that's what I was doing in the painting business was I was quoting the jobs, negotiating on the paint, uh, checking up on the jobs, orchestrating, oh, this one's behind schedule. This one's on schedule. Um, Amazing. Oh, I, I just am so impressed with that because, you know, I, most people I know in high school didn't have a full business going like you did, which to me, informs a little bit about the life that's going to unfold after that. So you're in the painting business, you're finishing high school, and then you choose some form of engineering. What I read was systems design engineering. So what caused you to make that decision and that move to go to University of Waterloo, which is an engineering school, and do systems design engineering? Give, give me a sense of that decision. Well, 
I was always a good kid. Uh, at least I thought I was. And my father thought I should be an engineer. So I became mm. an engineer because he was an engineer and, and it was what ah. I thought I should do. Um, systems design was computers. And back then computers were in the infancy and I was just a normal boy at that age that loved the, the idea of new, com new things like technology or, or computers. So I was just getting in on the, the current wave, but it was more, uh, because I was interested in it, it was a passion, um, and whatnot. University of Waterloo, um, I liked the co-op program. So you go to school four months, work four months. Um, I paid for a hundred percent of my university and my, uh, apartments and, uh, every car I bought, like I, I, I wasn't supported in any of this. So I was sort of part of my plan. I got paid a lot of houses to save a lot of money to go to the university and, um, and, and co-op just made it that much easier. Plus you, uh, you come up with uh, two years work experience, having worked at companies, which is a little better than, uh, than not, at least that's what I thought at the time. Yeah. And, and so you're going through university and, uh, and, um, but this entrepreneurial bug is stuck in you that I'm aware of. Like you're, you're doing it in high school. Did you start, did you do anything in university? Was there any entrepreneurial bug that took over at that point? Obviously you're working in the co-op, so you're going and working with other businesses, but you, you've got this entrepreneurial spirit. So what's going on with that? So mostly through university, I, um, worked on my work terms and worked, um, uh, and went to school in the school terms. I always had a part-time job. So I, uh, would lifeguard, I was certified lifeguard. So I get a lifeguarding job. Um, I learned very quickly because you're moving every four months. The day you move, you have to get into something new because four months pass as fast as you think. But I kept on painting houses. So I painted mm. houses and those ones I, I more or less did personally, not very often, but I'd usually do one house uh, per school term, maybe two houses on a work term, just because it was sure money. Um, and I knew how to do it and, uh, it is not, was not particularly hard at, at that age. Um, I had my systems and process down and for that matter, sometimes people would ask me to, uh, you know, it's through referral. People would, uh, get to know I was painting, uh, and whatnot. So I kept the painting business going, but I didn't start anything meaningful through uh, until my last year at university. Okay, so, so we get into your last year of university. You've gone through this program. You've got your sort of site set on some some kind of design engineering, systems design, computers. Uh, what happens in your last year? So in my last year, I knew I wanted to design circuit boards. To design circuit boards, I needed a computer. Computers back then were very expensive, but I got a better deal if I bought two of them. So I bought two and sold one. And someone else wanted one, so I bought another two. And then someone wanted a printer. Then they wanted a disk drive. And then I upgraded my memory and I sold some more memory. And so next thing you know, I'm buying and selling computer hardware, software, and peripherals. And I did that a little bit in my fourth year, um, but it didn't. I didn't go at it actively until I graduated. And uh, I applied for a job at a company that I had a work term at, and. Uh, this is going to date me. I basically said, uh, you know, I'll take the job if you offer me $25,000. And right. they said, they're not going to offer me $25,000. So I said, okay, no problem. I'll just, uh, start my, uh, my own business. And so I started the circuit board design business. And then I was at the same time at the, on the side, I was buying and selling computer products after about two years or two and a half years, I had probably about 20 employees and I was in a, a few thousand square foot facility and I ran out of space. So I took the engineers and I split them into another company and sold half of that company to the engineers. And that company was the, the circuit board design company. They're mm. still in business today. The name of the company is connect tech. It got sold a couple of years ago to Heiko. And, uh, my partners in that business were the best people in the world, the best partners in the world. They knew how to run the business. I give them credit for growing. It, it never grew very big, but they had 140 people, I think, when they sold to Heiko and uh, they were profitable for decades. They just ran a really good business. And I stayed with the distribution business. Mm. So I, um, you know, kept my 3,000 square feet, added some more staff, moved to a bigger place. At one point, I was moving the business every single year because our sales would 
double. Our sales would go up. So that business, I eventually grew to a couple billion dollars in sales. Right. And that's that's actually the time I first intersected with you when we did the television show together. Uh, and um, to me, like at that point, you were one of the largest um, distributors of electronic uh, computer products at that point in Canada at that point. Were you not? I would have been. I would have been one yeah. of the um, top five, probably. So I wasn't the top. But okay. I was not the top, but I would have been one of the top five. And uh, yeah, so I grew that business to a couple billion in sales. Um, I spawned a couple of businesses out of that business and spun them off. But um, I also saw a lot of technology products. Right. And I started investing in these companies. So I invested in over 150 technology startups. Um, and I was an advisor, a board member, um, a mentor to those to many of those companies, dozens of those companies. I know you're involved in the boards. It's obviously what the podcast is about. And uh, so I sat on dozens of boards. The most famous company I did was uh, BlackBerry. So I did BlackBerry. I joined that board before they were public and stayed on that board for 13 years. So I left that board in 2010. Um, and that was after I had sold my business and I retired in 2010. But I got back into it. Right. So, um, so you go EMJ data that becomes actually at some point you went public and that became Synex, I guess, just a little bit That's of the, right. the, the, comp, the, the, the process of the story. So EMJ data, you took to, uh, $2 billion at a certain point, it became Synex, which, which then you went through the whole process of becoming publicly traded at that point, or was that before? So we were, uh, EMJ went public 10 years before, uh, it. It, before it merged with Synex. And uh, I didn't get it to $2 billion until after it merged with Cynix. So when it merged with Cynix, uh, um, when I joined, it merged, I think we were only doing about 350 million in sales. Um, and then over the next five years, I grew it from 350 to 2 billion. Um, and then after I left Cynix, it merged with TD, Tech Data, and Tech uh. it became TD Cynix, and Tech Data was one of the top three distributors. So when we merged with Cynix, we were in the top three and then they just merged. They've got to be the, the largest by far. Yeah. And, uh, they would be doing 50 billion or I don't know. It's the big, right. big numbers. They're probably they're public. You can look it up. Yeah. But, but, but I, I asked that because it's, it's helpful to recognize that, uh, you done startup, you grew those startups, you, um, you sort of splinter, not splintered, but you, uh, created companies that then you formed their own. They went off and did their thing. Uh, you invested in companies, you sat on boards, uh, and you grow to a $2 billion enterprise, and then you retire. So, right. so you retire, and is it because you're just tired, or is it because you feel like you've done what you could at Cinex? What's, what's, your, what's the decision-making that goes into your retirement? Well, I had been at Cinex for five years, so I was kind of doing a corporate gig. And, um, it's kind of one of the things you're, I, I, again, it's almost influenced by, by, by my parents. You go, you start your business, you grow to a certain size, you sell for a lot of money and then you retire. But I was too young to retire and I didn't realize it at the time. Um, and, and, and so I, what I did is I resigned all of my boards, made a clean break and moved to New York. Cause I wanted to do a stint in the States. It was either going to be New York or Silicon Valley. The reason I chose New York is my parents were aging and I, it was just closer to fly back to Toronto than to uh, fly back from California. Um, and then sh uh, while I was in New York, I sat on some boards. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I started filling my dance card again. So I was doing some angel investing and doing some advising work and stuff like that. Um, and then my dad got sick five years after I was in New York. And so I moved quickly back to Guelph, Toronto and, um, um, uh, and then I sat on this board. It was an advisory board of Danby Appliances and the CEO resigned. I was back in Canada by then. And, uh, I said, I can go in and run it. Uh, Danby at the time was about a $400 million company. And, um, so it was in a size range that I was comfortable with. And I, and I, but I was just going to go run it for six or eight months, just as a, a placeholder to keep things together. And, um, then I started running a business again. I said, that's what I want to do. So I retired too young 
And then the, and so I said, that'll be my next decade gig. And then the ownership group said they wanted me to sell the company. And I said, okay, great. How much for? And they told me, and I said, fine, I'll take it. So that's how I ended up owning Danby Appliances. Ah, got it. So this whole, this whole story unfolds that you actually sit on the board. Um, you, you're told to sell the company or you're, you're asked to sell the company and then you buy it yourself, which is, it's a beautiful thing. It's just, it's delightful. So you've been running Danby since 2015. Is that that's correct? That correct? Yeah, that's right. It, and give me a sense of the size and scope of Danby now in terms of uh, overall uh, footprint of Danby, how big it is, what, what, what that company looks like. I mean, I'm aware of it, but for someone who may not know of it. So we did about, we did almost half billion dollars and we, um, we sell and make about 2 million appliances a year. So our strength is in bar fridges, freezers, wine coolers. We also have a reasonably large air conditioning business. So we sell window and portable air conditioners. And there are other products we don't make that we sell, you know, things like microwaves and ranges and laundry. So we sell a pretty complete range. We sell a lot of our products through retail. So Costco, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, uh, Target, all the retailers sell quite a bit online, Amazon, Wayfair, as well as Costco.com and Home Depot.com. Um, and then we have divisions that sell to hotels where we have fairly dominant market share. Um, and we have division that sells academic, another one that sells builder because, and, and builder, we just locked into our, our appliances are smallish European sizing or smaller. And, right. uh, what's happened in the builder market is all of a sudden everybody's building small. So people right. are building condos now that are right. 600 square feet, 700, our product just happened to work perfectly. Perfect. I'd like to say I looked in the crystal ball and said this was going to happen. I didn't do that. It's just that we started in the way that we were doing small appliances. That's so interesting. It's such a great story. It, since since I last talked to you, what what a uh, what a cool story. But um, there's this is other part of the story that that uh, if you're in Canada, a lot of times you're aware of this. But there's this other piece, and it's not that the U.S. doesn't know it, and it's been featured in the U.S. But um, there's this other stream to your life, which I think is so cool, which is this priority to serve others. And um, so much so that in, I think, 2018, you were uh, you were awarded the Order of Canada, uh, 2019, the Order of Ontario, really incredibly high praise for the work you've done, um, not in the business world, but in the not in in the in the philanthropy world. Can you tell me a little bit about that story, about the, the story, not just of the most recent, the sort of the, the big thing that put you on the map for that, but the life up till then? Well, you know, I had built the business and I sold it for a lot of money and I retired and uh, I wasn't as happy as I thought I should be or could be. And so I did a lot of self-reflection and I ended up with uh, an eccentric view on wealth. And my belief is you want a certain amount of wealth because, uh, you know, you, I'm, I'm going to get old. I might need someone to help me look after myself. I, you know, I want family to be, I want to be comfortable, but above that wealth, you, you should just give it away. And you see, the problem is I lost purpose when I, um, had enough money. I have no longer a need to make more money. Now, if anybody asks me, why do you need to make more money? I need to make more money to do more good. So I actually have the same urgency of. I'm going to call it making money or, or doing business that I had when I was in my twenties, when I had no money, because the urgency to do good, it, there's so much going on in the world. There's so much that needs doing. Um, we, we, it's, it's daunting. Yeah. So the, um, this daunting thing that you see in front of you, but leads you to do a bunch of cool stuff. And I, I know that, that this is not a thing that you, you sort of shout from the hills. Right. You've got this belief that there's there's work that needs to be done in the world. So give me a couple of the things up until what you did in Guelph in the last couple of years, in the last few years with the Syrian refugees. But give me a sense of some of the things along the way that you also because this, this has been a part of your passion for years, not just since you retired. That's right. So I've always been an environmentalist. So a lot of it comes around to environment stuff. So actually, when I was going to the University of Waterloo, I started a recycling program before the university had a recycling program. So I started the first recycling program at the University of Waterloo. That was my earliest environmental credential. 
Um, one of the side businesses that I spun out of my company was Simply Clean, which made environment friendly detergent product. And then after we sold, my brother went very heavy in the wind business. So uh, he did sky generation and uh, I invested a little in that. And um, so we've done a lot of the environment eco things. When I had the epiphany on what the purpose of wealth is and ended up with my eccentric view. The reason I say it's an eccentric view is I travel with friends in business who are worth a lot of money and think they need to make more money, but mm. you can only eat so much food. You can only drink so much wine. You can like, I, I only want one house. I that's even too much to look after. Um, and, and right. so at some point y y y turning it to saving the world. So early on in my philanthropy, all I was doing is I just would have my accountant calculate my net worth every year and I give away everything over that amount. So I had a charity budget, which I would donate to various causes. So a, mo a lot of my causes are in Guelph. Um, I did, you know, hospice, Wellington, uh, obviously United Way, both hospitals, um, uh, it, homeless charities, uh, you know, Royal right. City Mission, uh, Hope House. Um, and in our small community, I would be one of the uh, right. largest donors. And, uh, and then that's when Syria happened. And I decided to sponsor 50 Syrian refugee families. And 50 Syrian refugee families. And, and the, this is what sort of threw you, like put you, you, you were a huge philanthropist in the, in the area, but put you on the map because uh, I remember seeing CBS and other television stations talking about you uh, here in the U S and, uh, and talking about the, the fact that you were sponsoring 50 families, which was not 50 people, that's 50 families. And it was housing and it was jobs. And it was like, it was a massive it was a massive project. It wasn't just handing some money over it. Like there, there was a massive investment of focused energy commitment to really securing the lives of 50 families. You're absolutely right. And there were two unintended consequences of that. One unintended consequence was this outsized amount of press. Like it, it was CBS, but it was in every publication, New York times. It was like in, in all mainstream media made me the poster child of refugee. I didn't, I had no expectation that would happen because right. I had donated more money to other causes. And you get a little plaque in the hospital that says, you know, thanks to uh, Dan B Appliances or Jim Estill or whatever. And, and so I didn't expect it um, to go as viral as it did. Um, the, another one that happened, the articles were um, quite positive. The comments were vile. So I had a lot of negative mm. comments, including threats and death threats. And because of course everyone says, oh, I'm just bringing terrorists in. And uh, other ones I, I didn't really understand is, well, what he doesn't, why wouldn't he do something for Canadians before he does something for foreigners? And, well, right. you know, kind of look at my track record. I, I kind of set up the homeless uh, uh, soup kitchen and well, like I kind of did a lot of this, but I think part of the reason for the press, it was, there was some controversy or fear, Islamophobia. Um, even though not everybody I brought in was, uh, Muslim. And, uh, the other reason is I did have to set up these systems and process. Right. So I set it up like a business. Every family that comes in gets four or five mentor families. One mentor family has children the same age. One mentor family ideally speaks the language of the person coming in. One mentor family, um, has been a mentor family before because I like to, them to be experienced. Um, and the mentor families have checklists, just like a business, pick them up at the airport, arrange the arrival meal, arrange mm. the short-term place to stay, find long-term accommodation, get it furnished, get the housewares, get the linens, register the kids in school, set up the bank account, find a doctor, find a dentist, um, make sure you've got your permanent residence card, right. get your, uh, register for your health card. If you need a license, get your training, uh, get a bus pass, ride the bus with them. I mean, the, it's a checklist. Un yeah. And, yeah. and then we do scorecarding again, like business. So every two okay. weeks to start with, we check in and say, okay, so is the family adjusting? Well, what, what's their issues? Okay. So, um, the 14 year old needs, uh, an English tutor. And I had a group of volunteer directors. So I had a director of education. So the two, they need a tutor director of education. What's that? Well, here's 
our list of mm. tutors that can come and help. Um, we had a director of um, housing. So um, if the mentor groups can't find housing, here's some sources of housing, which is still a problem. And uh, director of jobs. Um, so uh, the whole program is premised on four pillars. The one pillar is people working, speaking English, some degree of integration and giving back. So everything we build around trying to do that. So what the first pillar is jobs. So we need to, um, we actually select refugees who are willing to work and, right. uh, and then we help channel them to get them job ready. And, um, we assign a job coach, which does resume writing, uh, shows them how to use indeed, uh, suggests how to approach interviews in Canada, do, do the dress for success. If you're uh, dressing right. for an office job, or if you're uh, going for a warehouse job, we get you safety shoes, that, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So it's what, what is so fascinating about that is how you've brought this whole, and it's something that you've been building over the years is how to put together a system, a process. Uh, you started with the painting business where you had, you know, you got to the, the, the checklist that you did walking around to people's houses that now shows up and continues to inform so much of what you do in the world. Um, not just the cause, but how you, how you invest and what you do with that investment. I, I think it's just amazing. Well, I, on refugee, I wish more businesses would get involved and more business people. And the reason is business people know how to organize things, right? Business people know how to scale things. So I didn't think settling 50 families was that big a deal. Actually, my wife always complains because whenever I say, oh, I think maybe we should do something, then I, I usually don't just um, do it on the side or I, I usually do, you know, I'll, I'll, no problem. I, I think I should make this product. Well, I'm going to make 10,000 or 100,000. I don't make, uh, I don't make <laughs> 10 of them, right? Uh, as a matter of right. fact, one of the projects I'm looking at is homeless housing. And, uh, and so I went to Austin, Texas and visited a tiny home community that was set up for homeless people. And I said, oh, okay, we're going to do that in Canada. And of course, my way of doing is, okay, so we'll set up a factory to make the kits to get assembled. And, uh, it, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not going and saying I'm going to make one on the weekend. It's like, oh, uh, no, we, we need to make 2000. So how do you make 2000? Well, you, you set up a factory to, um, turn out the walls and try to make it as Ikea like as possible so that uh, less skilled people can assemble them, put them together. Right. And, right. uh, that's, that's just a example of what I usually do on scale. Yeah. Well, so cool. So given, given our, I, I wanted to talk about that because I think what it does is creates context for the, all of the stuff that we're going to talk about now for the next uh, little while, which is related to boards and advisory boards. And, uh, but I'm interested in learning your insights and perspectives on those, given your experience of building companies, taking them public, um, scaling them dramatically, uh, investing in 150, I think you said, um, all the way you were, you were in research with research in motion at BlackBerry through much of their massive growth period. Um, and so, and, and I know you sit on other boards, you still sit on other boards and, and still sit on advisories, but, um, how are the companies you've built? Let, let's go back to EMJ Cynics, um, and even Danby now, um, have you run, invested, or engaged in advisory boards? And can you tell me a little bit about the structure of those or how you think about those? Sure. I mean, uh, EMJ, my first company had a board and, uh, and of course, when we went public, we needed to have a board. So we actually had a fiduciary board with, uh, all the fiduciary stuff. Um, Dan B now has a board. Uh, we're a private company. I don't, there's nothing compelling me to have a board. It is an advisory board, which means the board could tell me the board can't fire me. The board right. could tell me to do something and I can say fine, but I'm not doing it because, um, right. Uh, but I'm. It, and I have sat on a lot of boards. The role of the board member is largely to make informed suggestions mm. based on experience, but the role of management is to filter that and make that into something usable. Boards, uh, someone once said, you know, you should have noses in and fingers out. And sometimes board members think they should be running a business. The times they tend to do that is when the business isn't doing well. So the business isn't doing well. So oh, come on, I, I got to go in and I got to interview the 
vice president of sales. I better interview the sales managers because something's happening here. They're not selling enough. But um, that's the job of management. The job of the board is to hire the CEO and make suggestions. And I have learned the best way to make suggestions is through asking naive questions. Mm. So a simple question like, tell me what's happening with the inventory here. Like, that is a legitimate question, but what are you kind of also suggesting? Kind of suggesting maybe you need to watch your inventory <laughs> or have good explanation. Right. And to some extent, I am trying to find out, do, do they understand what's going on with the inventory or are they ending up with too much of the wrong stuff in inventory or, or whatever? So um, the more I can phrase a suggestion as a question, I, I prefer to do that. Um, and recognize management shops to run the business. Um, and you're not full time. So their context is different than my context. And even experience doesn't exactly transfer. So uh, if you ask me how to sell, well, based on my early days in EMJ, I'll tell you, I'll give you the secret to sales. You need to send a lot of faxes. That's what you should be doing. Well, uh, if I tell them my advisory board to the, some of these kids today, they won't even know what a fax is. Right. Because that's your experience and your, what helped you to build EMJ was faxes. But, and so that gives you experience, but it doesn't necessarily mean you know how to run the day to day of uh, a, a tech startup today uh, by telling them about faxes. That, that's, that's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. So let me just jump back because EMJ, you said before you had a, a fiduciary board, uh, it was an advisory board and Danby currently has an advisory board that's not fiduciary. Um, what structure do you meet quarterly? Do you have, do you have full like half day meetings? Is it more ad hoc? What's your process M more so like what, what's the actual nuts and bolts of what it looks like? So um, Danby's advisory board is very much like a fiduciary board. So they get the same reporting. So every month there's financial statements together with an MDNA, a management discussion on why something happened. Sales were up because of this. We lost this order. We got that order. This product's doing well. This product's not, whatever. Um, and then we have quarterly meetings, which are the better part of a day. Um, we like to go out to dinner. Um, depending on the format, we've moved from location to location. So, uh, so the board members can see different locations. Um, we tend to have a different, uh, person present at each meeting, one different part of the business. So, um, it might be the operations manager presents, and then the next time it will be a product person present. Mm. The next time it could be engineering present. And that gives the board over a period of time, a, a, a feel to more of the management and a feel to more of w what is important. Like, okay, so you guys have quite a bit of regulatory issues with CSA and UL, and that's part of your business. And, and they get that because they meet with different people. Right. However, on a board meeting, which ours are usually about six hours, that would only be maybe one hour of the board mm. meeting is, okay. um, although we will often invite management also to the dinner or the lunches so they can sort of mingle with the, right. With the board right. members. So, so those board meetings then, uh, are you leading those board meetings or do you have an external facilitator who helps process that for you? So you're part of it or are you leading those? So I, I do lead the, the okay. board meetings. I, I sit on other boards. I don't necessarily fully think the way I do it is the best way. Um, I mean, best practice in a board should be that the chair should not be the CEO. Right. I, I happen to be the chair of Danby's board and I am the CEO and I'm operational every day. I do set the agenda. I do, uh, right. I don't do all the, I don't do many of the presentations though. I do a CEO, uh, okay. update, but the presentations are done by the divisions. So the divisions right. present their, their numbers, their sales, their margin, uh, top customers, top products. Um, and then they take questions. Um, one, I, of course, my employees might watch this, but one secret, I, I sometimes ask the board members to ask my management questions. So I sometimes say, well, can you make sure that uh, th this division, uh, th that you're asking the question of, you know, why are we selling more in New York or whatever right. the, yes. um, the, the and, and that sort of is sometimes people will listen more to a board member than they'll listen to me. They work for me, but they see me every day and I'm just Jim. 
all of a sudden, oh, gee, this is Mr. Grenwall. He's uh, ex uh, um, president of uh, Whirlpool. Maybe he knows more. And yeah, Jim so so that that leads to another question, which is how do you choose the people sitting on your board? Do they sort of process through over a period of a couple of years? Uh, do you have some sort of adding new people based on some of the uh, the agenda that you have for the upcoming years? What what and how are you filling that board and what's the size of that board? So I have five people on my board, which okay. I like that as a board size. You can usually get five people together when you get to seven people. Sometimes schedules don't work. Um, if you get nine people, then sometimes there's a lot of repetition because every board right. member needs to say the same thing to your uh, sales are lower than they should be. And then the next right. person say, well, I thought your sales should be higher. Um, yeah. So I, I personally like five okay. uh, people. And again, this is sort of do as I say, not as I do. We're not a very balanced board, but the ideal we'd have not just a bunch of old white guys on the board. It should be balanced with some diversity of age, some diversity of gender, some diversity, possibly racially. Um, and I do deliberately try to find people with different um, seats. So mm -hmm. in my EMJ days, I had a lawyer on my board and right. I filled the legal, legal seat, um, yes. yep. with, a and I, I, uh, often will have an accountant, a CFO, someone who is a, a largely a numbers guy. I will often have someone who's an industry person. So an industry person, like I have yep. ex CEO of uh, Whirlpool, my experience on board members is often they, he, he is there because he's, you know, industry, right. but he knows how to read financial statements. I mean, he's yes. CEO, yes. like he knows the, the absolutely. Uh, right. But, but it's, it's, it's you, you have purposefully built them over the years with some degree of perspective that sits on them to support you in the way you're thinking, uh, in the way that you're trying to drive the company forward as a supportive entity to you. Um, you've said that you've, you've invested in a lot of businesses. You sat on research in motions board, both pre going public and post going public, right? So uh, as well as you've invested in a lot of companies, you've sat in other advisory boards. Um, how how um, do you see the difference between, say, where you are at a half a billion dollars versus these startups that you've invested in? When you sit on their advisory board, what's the, what's the difference that you feel maybe between what's happening in your board and what's happening in theirs? Well, the problem is many companies are more amateur and they need more coaching on how to be right. more professional around their board. Um, most smaller companies are doing fire drills every day. And so they don't have as much time to prepare board material. I mean, I actually don't prepare anything but my CEO letter for my board material. I don't do any, I've got a CFO that does all the financials and each one of the division managers does their, their part. I sit in, we, we do a uh, review of all of the the decks before they go with the whole management team. And so I provide some coaching, but I'm kind of acting as the coach. Other people do it. Problem with startup often it is the CEO that has to do it because they don't have everybody to, right. to do it. Um, the, uh, I, I tend to be focused around growth and, uh, whatnot. Many smaller companies, um, it works for everything to be in memory. It doesn't work when you're a company of scale. So when you're doing 2 million in sales or 5 million in sales, and maybe you, you don't even need a purchase order system because you kind of remember what you ordered and what the right. price is, but, right. uh, you have to think, well, when you're doing 20 million, like, are you going to be able to do all this? You're not going to be able to do all this. Um, and, uh, so you don't have the systems and processes. Yeah. So when you sit on a board, and, and that, that to me raises another, when you sit on a board, because of your history, your experiences and that, like what's the, if you're asked, let, let's say you've made an investment and because of that investment, you're also asked to sit on the board or you're just sat, you're asked to sit on a independent advisory board. What do you feel like internally, even if the, even if the asker is, doesn't inform you on this, what do you feel like is your particular perspective that you bring to it? What do you? When you're sitting at that board table and you're reading their financials or any of those kind of things, what's that perspective that you bring? What's the superpower 
that you add to the equation in that particular seat because you have such a broad history of stuff, but it, but sometimes internally you're thinking a certain way. So my superpower um, is mostly around entrepreneurial creativity. Mm. And even entrepreneurs which have businesses tend to not necessarily think of um, of everything. For example, right now, Danby Appliances has a piece of property that we're selling that's perfect for a tracking terminal. And of course, we're trying to arrive at a price how much we're going to sell this small piece of property for. And um, we've kind of got close on a price, but uh, entrepreneurial creativity, well, why don't you let me wrap some of your trailers? That has a value to Danby, cost them nothing. That's a win-win. Why don't we, um, why don't you just give us a, a, a credit on shipping? I, I know we're, you know, half a million dollars apart on this. So you give me half a million dollar credit that we use on shipping. Again, mm. I, I, it's creative because yeah. it's not cash they have to put down. It's, I'm going to use a half a million dollars in trucking, no problem. It's win-win. They can then go and say, oh, look, we, we ship for Danby Appliances. Aren't we a good company? You should use our right. trucks. That type of entrepreneurial creativity, um, I don't, for some reason it's, it's not as common. I, I guess the other role that I do play is, um, is the growth and the scalability. Um, it, and that's where I found I actually got in fairly high demand is there's a lot of people taking companies from zero to 10 million, zero to 20 million, lots of they they're, they're diamond dozen, but as soon as you say 20 to 50 million or 20 to a hundred million or a hundred million to a billion. You tend to have many less people who have done that. So I right. got that that's where the demand is. At the same time, mostly what I'm looking for on a board is high chemistry of stuff that's interesting to me. So mm. if, if I get along really well with the CEO and I think, you know, the, that I can add more value than it, I'm I want to board this fun is the end of the day, at the end of the day, right? It's, it's not, um, and I, I'm an entrepreneur. I just don't love the, um, legal stuff. Like I, right. I and I am on fiduciary boards, but you know, I, I don't need to have the minutes last minute meeting read and you know, whatever. <laughs> Robert, Robert's rules aren't, aren't Robert's always rules. the fun part. Um, so so you've you've done a lot of that and you've been with some really interesting companies I already said um you you went through the you went through what 14 years on the the research and motion board through through a lot of crazy growth um um but the you've also been with 150 investments and I know you didn't sit as an advisor on every single one of those but you've sat on boards that went the uh, or with companies that were going downhill right that that weren't surviving very well what kind of position um, or how did you process that? Are, are, do you sit in that seat then as companies are going the other direction, not in the growth cycle and not in the, in the, um, the scalable process, but they're dying because they had a great idea. They, it, it made sense on paper, but now they're starting to tank. What are you doing in the board in those cases? How are, how are you bringing your wisdom to that perspective? So when a bit business is not doing well, usually because their concept is wrong, they can't do the product for the price they said, the customers don't want to buy it or whatever, then that's where entrepreneurship kicks in. And maybe the business needs to pivot. So I love the pivot stage and say, mm. okay, well, you've got this asset. Let's use the engineers to do this. Oh, you've got this, this, these three customers do love you. Well, let's uh, go more in on those customers. However, at some points, the companies um, you'll learn just can't make it and they're going to run out of money. Um, in which case, um, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say I've been in, in, in involved in a number of what I call rescue exits. Mm. So you're better off to sell your business for 10 cents in the dollar or 20 cents or 50 cents in the dollar, come out, you know, save your employees, their jobs, um, get some value for the asset than to say, no, I'm going to stay on this sinking ship until it's on the bottom of the ocean. Like I've got a sinking right. ship. Let's sell it to someone else who has a, a barge that can maybe make some use out of my sinking ship. And um, I've had rescue exits that actually worked out. So mm. I, um, I told you about Simply Clean was an environment-friendly detergent product. I was not making money on it. Couldn't make money on it because uh, 
detergents, we were liquid detergents, very heavy, competing with Procter & Gamble, couldn't get the volume. And so I traded it to a company called Pure Source for a percentage of their business. I sat on their advisory board. Yeah. And then um, that business sold to Now Foods. So eventually I got my money plus quite a bit out. So it worked out that it's as if it was a successful exit, but it happened 10 years after I had the sinking ship, which I had gotten off of. And at the same time, when you traded it to Pure Source, the reason Pure Source could make money on it is um, they already had trucks going to all the grocery stores, all the health food stores. Um, they had an infrastructure. They were already going to the same trade shows. When we were going to the trade shows, we were only selling detergent. They were going right. and selling uh, supplements and tea and uh, right. their whole thing, their health whole line. Food. So it was yeah. easy for them. And uh, so looking for synergies and I have also become pretty good at creative deal uh, structuring. Mm. So in that one, I also negotiated a royalty. So I actually get a royalty on simply clean um, sales, even to this day. So uh, I'm not gonna do, I, I can't live on the royalty check from that, right. but I, it, it, I get a, a royalty. And yes. often when you're selling a business, there's ways to creatively bridge the valuation gap or ask for something which doesn't cost the, the buyer much or they don't value that costs you. And it's so easy and win-win, it, uh, it works. Yeah. So, so I, I think what I hear you saying is a lot of times, uh, even if there is something transitioning that looks negative, uh, with the right perspective and the right insight sitting at the table, uh, there are often creative opportunities. There's creative ways to, to, to deal with this loss, what looks like a loss or failure that actually becomes a success in the long run, which, which is a delightful perspective to take. Cause I, I think so often people get in that situation and they, they throw in the towel instead of going, what are all the cool assets that we've got here? And how could these assets be leveraged for something even better? Exactly. And the other things, even if you throw in the towel, often you can get some value for those assets. And right. often you get a value later in some other business that gets done. And yeah. uh, it's not what you think it is. It often comes out with something else, but works. Yeah. Delightful. So a, 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 let's say a tech CEO, and maybe they're in the hardware side versus the software side, comes to you. They're, they're not asking you to be on their advisory board. They just want clean advice. I think I need help. I think I need um, support. I, I've heard an advisory board is a good thing. How would you recommend them to proceed with that? What, what recommendations would you give them? What, what two or three critical things would you suggest they do? So you, first, you're, I know I'm preaching to the converted, but an advisory board is one of your best investments mm. and you should pay them, but it, it isn't gonna be as expensive. You're, you're buying wisdom. Um, and a good advisory board <laughs> will re really help. So my suggestion is you try to, to say who, 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 and what do you think your advisory board will be? Um, I have sat on advisory boards with ex prime ministers who don't read the material, mm. who don't contribute at a board meeting, who take three quarters of the airtime at a board meeting, not talking about anything but the good of the company. So it, title and history doesn't necessarily mean someone will be a good board member. Right. Um, I talked about, you know, have it filling different chairs for different things. That's a good idea. But the chemistry and does the person, will the person be willing to uh, um, help? Um, as far as compensation goes, I always say, you want to have people on your advisory board who don't need the money. Right. Therefore, but you still pay them as yeah. opposed to if you, uh, cause I have seen, uh, perfect board members who need the money and that's their, yeah. their job, but then it, uh, they tend to not have the experience or the, yeah. if you're in the situation where you actually need the money. Right. Right. No, it, it's a really good, I, I think it's a really good point. It's a great investment, um, by wisdom. And I think there's always value in the exchange, right? So somebody sits on your board you pay them. And a lot of, a lot of times startups want to go, well, I want this for free. It's different if it's an investor, but if it's somebody you want to bring wisdom to your, your situation and your direction, paying them 
is a fair exchange of value. And, and, and I think that just keeps everything clean. And I just find it's, it's a much cleaner environment when, when the advisor sitting in your board is paid because it, it, it's, it ensures a cleanliness to the process as long as they're invested and there's chemistry and all those good things. But, but I think it's such an important point. And, and startups, one thing they have is they have stock options. So that's another yep. common type yes. and form of compensation, which right. is easy, easy to do. Yes. Yeah. No, that's great. Well, this has been really helpful. And uh, I think your history and experience and wisdom and knowledge has been really good to uh, to just listen to and experience because it, it informs so many other people in terms of what they can do. But uh, I always like to finish with a couple of rapid fire questions, and I'm just going to throw some at you. You can answer however you want, or you can pass if that's appropriate. But first question, Prius or BMW? Prius. Okay. I, um, I drive a Prius. I actually drive a Prius. It was one of the first Prius drivers yeah. in Ontario. And right. I've had- I kind of knew that. Four, I, I had I, four I, of them. I didn't know you knew that. Yeah. But but I, 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 think, it, I think that goes back to the- um, you know, your perspective on the world, which I think is a really beautiful thing. Uh, what's your favorite Danby product of all? Bar none, you look at the entire catalog, what's the favorite product? It's red contemporary classic bar fridge. It's cherry red. It's, it just is cool. It just is um, a really, really nice uh, bar fridge. And it's, it's simple. I, although I, I love the new five-in-one microwave we have because it's an air fryer and uh, a warming oven and a convection oven. And if I was single, I could probably do without an oven. It does so many things. And I would never replace an appliance that, that works, but I would consider replacing my microwave with one of these new microwaves because of the uh, added functionality. Because nobody wants to have an air fryer taking up counter space and then have, you know, a warming oven and multifunction. I love it. Beautiful. What's the book that has shaped you more than any other book? Is there a book that has so, shaped uh, you in some way? So I, I love um, Cialdini's uh, Power of Influence is yep. one um, that, that I really I resonate with. I, I like psychology, but I like science. He's good um, on that. I, I like another one, uh, 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing, which is written yep. by Rise and Trout. And that's an old one. It's a classic, but it just has so much logic and wisdom, simple rules. Yes. Um, who has been your most, prof uh, your most important professional mentor? Just, just who has over the years been that for you? That, that would be Frank Hasenfratz. So Hank, Frank Hasenfratz was a Hungarian refugee, lived in the bus terminal for two weeks in Montreal before making his way to Guelph, started a tool and, or he actually started working at uh, Danby's sister company. So he worked at Danby's sister, sister company. Um, he's a tool and die maker for a couple of years. And he said, oh, you're, you're buying, uh, how many of these plates are you buying? You know, we're buying a uh, hundred thousand a year. How much do you pay for them? I pay $4. Well, if I sold them to you for $3, would you do it? Sure enough, he goes and buys a machine, puts it in his garage, um, starts making these parts. Today, Linamar machines, I think they're close to $10 billion in sales. They are the largest employer in Guelph. They would have close to 10,000 employees in Guelph of their 20 or 30,000 employees. So he uh, was a neighbor and um, a very tough guy, but I got to know him so that his toughness is all, is, right. it's, it's just a gruff exterior. Yeah. Um, he was a neighbor and I played bridge with him every other week for uh, decades. And uh, so it was just a, a great, uh, he was a great mentor. Beautiful. Jim Estel, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you again, to, uh, to hear your story, uh, to see the, the, the amazing success, not just in terms of your business success and the influence you've had on hundreds and thousands of, of companies, but also the work you've done in the world, specifically um, the, the refugee families, the, the, all the work you've done under the scenes, hidden behind the scenes that don't get a whole lot of press. But uh, I just want to honor the fact that you've done some amazing things. So thank you for being with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure and joy. Thank you for having me.